Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is, as always, to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on YouTube on the third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. They are also available to watch anytime recorded on YouTube. We've had a great group of speakers so far as part of the seminar series, and I encourage you to check them all out. We also have a great group of speakers upcoming in the few months ahead, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two CMCC students, Quintarius Moore and Katie Floyd, who help with the seminar series. Thank you ahead of time for joining us. Please do subscribe and follow us on YouTube as well as on Twitter. A few quick guidelines. The seminar is being recorded. If you have questions during the presentation, please either email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or you can post them in the YouTube channel. Either way, they will be propagated to the speaker at the end of the presentation. And finally, last but not least, join me in welcoming today's speaker, Professor Navratsky. Professor Navratsky received her degrees in physical chemistry from the University of Chicago. After postdoctoral work in Germany and at Penn State University, she joined the faculty in chemistry at Arizona State University, where she remained until her move to the Department of Geological and Geophysical Sciences at Princeton University in 1985. She chaired that department from 1988 to 1991 and was active in the Princeton Materials Institute. In 1997, she became an interdisciplinary professor of ceramic, earth, and environmental materials chemistry at the University of California, Davis, as a, and was appointed the Edward Rossler Chair in Mathematical and Physical Sciences in 2001. She served as interim dean of the University of California, Davis College of Letters and Sciences Department of Mathematical and Physical Sciences from 2013 to 2017. She organized the Nano and New Materials and Energy, Environment, Agriculture, and Technology Research Group in 2002 and directed the Peter A. Rock Thermochemistry Laboratory since her arrival in 1997. She is currently the director of the Center for Materials of the Universe and professor, School of Molecular Sciences and School of Engineering for Matter, Transport, and Energy at Arizona State University. Professor Nebraski is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and we are very pleased to have her here today to join us for the mechanochemistry discussions. Please go ahead with the presentation. Are you ready to go over there? All right, you can please proceed with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, let, let me know when you want me to start. Please go ahead. Okay, very good. So it's a honor and a pleasure to participate in your series. I'm not sure exactly who the audience is, so I've kept this talk fairly general. I've titled it Mechanochemistry and Mock Thermodynamics. And myself, I'm a solid state chemist, physical chemist by training. I work at the borderline of solid state chemistry, thermodynamics, material science, geochemistry. My main interest is what makes various solids stable or unstable. So I work with ex other experimentalists and theorists, but our main uh, tool, if you will, is various forms of calorimetry that actually get us the energetics of formation of solids. 
And we became interested in metal organic frameworks about a decade ago. We've had a longer interest in zeolites, and I'll show you how some of these things are related and where mechanochemistry plays a role. And I will try to say what we know and to some extent what we don't know. So assuming again that people don't necessarily know what metal organic frameworks are, uh, metal organic frameworks are porous materials generally consisting of some sort of metal node containing one or more metal ions. They can be first row transition metals, second row transition metals, uranium, all sorts of different ions. And those are linked then by organic linkers, by organic molecules that are bidentate so that they link two nodes together. And the structures that form then are porous structures with very large pores, very large open spaces. And here, for example, uh, in yellow is the idea of the pore space in one of these MOFs, metal organic frameworks, and in purple on the right is just one of the packings, in this case, the so-called sodalite packing, which is common to zeolites and metal organic frameworks. And the left-hand side of the diagram just shows some of the metal organic frameworks that have been synthesized. So there is technological interest in metal organic frameworks as catalysts, as perhaps containment of nuclear waste, containment even of CO2. So some of these, and, and also in biomaterials and drug delivery and so on. So some metal organic frameworks already find technological uses. But I'm a fundamental scientist, so I'm really interested in the solid state chemistry of these materials. And I'm assuming the audience here is interested in how they are made and the role of mechanochemistry and its relation to thermodynamics. So that is what I'm going to be talking about. So the main question then is many new metal organic frameworks have been made, particularly by mechanochemistry, uh, particularly by a group of Thomas Lars Christchurch, who used to be on Montreal and now has moved to Britain. Uh, and his interest has been in synthesizing many sorts of porous materials, and he has perfected various mechanochemical ways of synthesizing them. Well, what does one mean by mechanochemical ways of synthesizing them? In this particular case, one means fairly gentle grinding of the starting materials, the components, with or without a small amount of catalyst or solvent present, and the materials will crystallize. And what is interesting is that they will go through a set of phase transitions with further grinding to form denser phases. The conventional way of making metal organic frameworks is usually some sort of solution process, some sort of solvothermal process, and typically that will make only one metal organic framework, and that will be a fairly open framework. So what the mechanochemical synthesis has done is make that open framework and allow it to transform to denser frameworks with additional grinding. So this basically raises a fundamental question, and that is, does the mechanochemistry, the additional grinding, lead to more stable phases, that is somehow it eliminates um, or circumvents barriers to kinetics of nucleation or growth so that one will make potentially more stable phases. Or as you put more energy into the material, are you actually making less stable phases by creating defects, by creating structures that are less stable? Uh, Christchurch and I met at a Gordon conference a number of years ago where we had posters next to each other, and we realized that we could actually answer this fundamental question by looking at the thermodynamics of the thermochemistry of these materials, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So the question then is, are they more stable or are they less stable? And uh, does the mechanochemistry enable materials to proceed down a free energy landscape toward more stable materials, or does it basically kick them upstairs into higher energy states because of damage? 
And certainly mechanochemistry and other um, cases, for example, on pyrochlor structures, fluoride structures at all, et cetera, which is typically done under harsher conditions than these synthesis, have made less stable phases, have amorphized materials, et cetera. So both possibilities definitely exist. So a little bit more about metal organic frameworks. Here are just a few examples of common ones uh, and ones that have in fact found some uh, use, some of which are already uh, made in industrial amounts. And in each case, then one has a metal node and one has a linker. And of course, the longer the linker, the bigger the pore, the often the larger the unit cell of these materials. And one can then make them uh, effectively in a large number of different structures. And we started working on the thermodynamics of these, oh, 50 years ago or so. But of course, if you change the linker, you're changing the structure, you're changing the bonding, you would really like to know how the structure changes affect energetics within a constant composition, within a constant linker. And that is what mechanochemical synthesis lets us do. That is, one basically can, in a whole set of materials, form real polymorphs. So, one type of metal organic frameworks that is very common is so-called zeolitic imidazole flame frameworks or ZIFs, and they are then a whole family of MOFs. The ligands are nitrogen-based. The metals nodes can be transition metals, for example, most commonly zinc, cobalt, copper, etc. And the metals are tetrahedrally coordinated to the bridging ligands. And here are just some examples of the structures that go in. Um, what makes it special? First of all, they're easy to make. Uh, they adopt topologies analogous to zeolites. That's a very interesting sort of situation. Uh, and they show polymorphism. So unlike other MOFs, ZIFs have relatively high thermal stability. Eventually, of course, especially under oxidizing conditions, they will burn. But a number of these can persist up to 300, 400 degrees centigrade. They have relatively high stability under hydrothermal conditions. So if they're used in some sort of catalytic uh, process in which one has water present, they don't immediately decompose. And of course, they have a high propensity for polymorphism, which is really the topic of my talk and the use of mechanochemistry. So polymorphism in ZIFs, here are some examples, the ability of the structure to adopt different forms at the same composition, but different geometry, different packing. And indeed then the question is, are there mechanistic limits to the synthesis of the materials or can one make basically any material you want? And the question then is in the mechanochemistry, can one then make materials of increasing stability or decreasing stability? And of course, the different polymorphs will have different properties, everything from ion exchange properties to electrochemical properties to catalytic properties, et cetera. Uh, and some of the denser ZIF polymorphs are actually potentially uh, interesting ferroelectrics. So they have a wide variety of possible uses. And this on the right-hand side is just some two-dimensional uh, renderings of some of the packings of some of the zeolite-like structures. And the point I want to make is that you have denser parts of the structure surrounding very large pores. And of course, they are absolutely beautiful geometries. So study the thermodynamic effect of porosity, that is molar volume or density, study the effect of polymorphism, study the effect of linker within a given structure and of the metal node within a given structure. That's our goal of thermodynamics. Now, a number of people have you know, tried to do these by theoretical calculations. I should stress that we're experimentalists and we actually then have experimental 
measured calorimetric values for heat formation, which then can be compared with, for example, what people calculate by DFT. And understandably, doing DFT calculations on these rather large volume, many atom systems is a non-trivial undertaking. And we have been collaborating with collaborators of Frischich in including some of that in our studies. So let me talk about our experimental techniques. So the first thing, of course, to make rabbit stew, you have to catch your rabbit and you have to know what sort of rabbit it is. You have to make your sample, you have to characterize it, for calorimetric measurements, you have to absolutely know the composition of the sample. If there are impurities in it of different phases of different organics, you need to know exactly what your sample is because your calorimetric experiment, finally, uh, the molecular weight of the sample comes into the calculations and the exact composition of the sample comes into the calculations. So what is our basic experiment? In many cases, and this is our signature technique, our basic experiment is the dissolution of a small amount of sample in a large amount of a molten salt solvent at high temperature. So this is something that we've worked on to a fair extent for oxides for many years. We've extended it to nitrides, carbides, oxynitrides, sulfides, etc. And the basic experiment then consists of dropping a small pellet, typically two to five milligrams of a sample, into a large amount of a molten salt solvent, typically 10 to 20 grams, where the material either dissolves or in the case of these organic containing materials, the material partially dissolves, that is the oxide part of the material dissolves in the melt. The carbon part of the material is oxidized fully to CO2, the nitrogen part of the material is evolved as nitrogen gas. And we've done a lot of work to basically uh, show that this is the case. The two molten salt solvents we use are a lead borate melt, which is suitable for silicates and germinates especially, and a sodium molybdate melt, which quite happily reacts with, for example, materials containing zirconium, titanium, transition metals, etc. And the sodium molybdate melt itself is an oxidation catalyst. That is, if you drop something into it with an air atmosphere or flowing air or flowing oxygen atmosphere, the sodium molybdate melt initially turns blue, meaning that the molybdenum plus six is reduced and the sample is oxidized. And the advantage here then is that you don't have to have a gas solid reaction to oxidize the sample. The oxidation occurs rapidly in the melt itself. And then within a matter of a few minutes, the melt returns to its initial clear yellowish at high temperature color. And the procedure then gives a well-defined final state. The calorimeter is essentially a heat flow calorimeter. It's a twinned calorimeter for various technical reasons. So we have two thermopiles, sets of thermocouples that connect the sample chamber where the reaction happens to a large heat sink, which is a constant temperature block. And this heat sink is surrounded by a furnace. So the whole system is at constant temperature, typically 700 or 800 degrees. This is our signature uh, technology, which we've developed. And over the last decade, it's been commercialized by the French company Ceteram and can now be bought as the Alexis calorimeter. And we have happily created a competition for ourselves by then letting a lot of other groups do the experiments. And the thing I'm happiest about is nowadays people that have bought those calorimeters are using them, no longer need our help and they publish papers without our names on them. So the technique is becoming much more mainstream. The actual calorimetric peak of dissolving the sample, and here is one that is an idealized peak, uh, the sample heats up, reacts, dissolves rapidly, but the heat transfer from the sample chamber to the constant temperature block is what actually determines the time constant of the calorimeter, which is typically about eight minutes, and then the number of half-lives you need before you get back to the initial signal to what we call the baseline. 
So our typical reactions are on the order of 45 minutes to an hour. We can deal with slower reactions. Uh, we are limited finally by the stability of the baseline signal. So if the reaction is too slow, we have to tweak conditions so that our reaction is over in less than about two hours. Otherwise, signal to noise becomes somewhat problematic. So that is our main technique. The calorimeter itself, here is our calorimeter, our Lexus calorimeter here at ASU. And again, we stand on the platform and can drop samples into the holes in the calorimeter in the back here. We see some of our gas manifolds, et cetera. So it's a large instrument, and then it has appropriate electronics for taking the signal, integrating it, et cetera. So now it's a well-defined technology. But for some of the, well, here then, we effectively have what is really the meat of my talk. Here we plot relative to a dense phase, the enthalpy of phases of increasing porosity, decreasing density. We like to use the molar volume as our thermodynamic variable, simply because if you look at thermodynamics, you have the uh, essentially equation that, you know, H equals E plus PV, so you have a pressure volume term. If you have high pressure, again, it's the volume that matters. So the thermodynamic parameter is the volume rather than the density. So we have here a set of data that we obtained for zeolites, or better said, zeotypes, uh, because materials that are not actually zeolites, but similar porous materials, for example, the silica polymorphs are sometimes uh, called zeotypes to distinguish them. And what we found over the years is that the energy goes up as the density goes down or the molar volume goes up. And it typically goes up, not hugely, up to about 20, 30 kilojoules per mole if we take one mole of tetrahedral ions. So that means that these various less dense phases are indeed thermodynamically accessible. And of course, the zeolites people have been making them for technological applications now for, you know, 40, 50 years, something of that sort. Interestingly enough, even for the zeolites, as you get to larger porosity, the curve becomes less steep. And perhaps, in fact, it sort of levels off at around 30 kilojoules per mole, saying that if you, increase, if you increase the porosity further, you're creating free space within the structure, which really does not affect its energetics very much. So we then have similar data for metal organic frameworks. Uh, in the zeolites, it's very easy to say what is our dense phase for the silicates for example, it's obviously quartz. For the MOPs, it's a little bit more difficult to say what is our dense reference state. We have essentially picked a dense reference state, perhaps a little bit arbitrarily for these metal organic frameworks. So the slight offset between the inorganic and the metal organic frameworks may be a choice of the reference state. But the trend that we see is very similar, that the energetics, the enthalpy that we measure by calorimetry, goes up with increasing molar volume. It doesn't go up very much, which means that these materials are energetically accessible, and it perhaps begins to level off at higher porosity. On the right-hand side of the slide, we come back then to the materials made mechanochemically by Frischer's group, and we have two sets of materials here. And the interesting thing then is this addresses the question that we basically put forth at the beginning of the talk. And that is, does the grinding to make increasingly denser phases, does it increase the energy of the material? Does it decrease the energy of the material? Well, looking at the zeolites, our prediction was that we are actually making denser phases and therefore we're making more stable phases. But here we have the proof in terms of the calorimetry for two sets of materials. And this is the first time that we could really separate 
the effect of structure in terms of polymorphism from the effect of composition. Because if you're varying the nature of the uh, ligand at the same time as you're varying the density, you have a lot of variables that you cannot separate. So here the attractive thing is that we basically can separate the variables and the right hand side says within a given structure, within a given composition, this is the effect of the change in structure. And indeed, as one continues grinding the sample, one goes toward denser phases. What is interesting in these two cases is that the most dense phase you form is not the same structure. So what do we not know about this? Uh, we do not know if there are other kinetically inaccessible phases of either intermediate density or even higher density. These are the ones that have been made. We do not fully understand what the actual mechanism of the transformation during grinding is. I won't go into that. Fischer's group has some ideas on it, but I think there's a lot more that still needs to be done, both from the point of view of theory and the point of view of experiment. <coughs> what we do know conclusively then is that the grinding obeys the sequence that I had first on my slide, that is that it somehow lifts energy barriers and allows one to make denser phases of less metastability. Yes, these materials are all energetically metastable uh, with respect to some sort of dense reference state, but that's okay. I mean, one makes deals with metastable materials all the time. So this, in a sense, is the slide that is the meat that relates mechanochemistry to thermodynamic stability and polymorphism. And at the risk of repeating myself, what we show quite conclusively in several systems is that increased grinding leads to denser phases. Denser phases are more stable. On the other hand, of course, the nature of the linker of the ligand is important. And it's not just the spacer. What we've seen in a lot of experiments over the last several years is that presumably the electron density in the linker depends on the peripheral groups in the linker. And then you have a competition between the electron density that might be around the nitrogen that then links to the metal node where, and the electron density that is affected by various peripheral groups in the linker. And these effects can be fairly large. Here, for example, we just show the energetics of several different linkers uh, and the effects on the structure. And we see that basically different linkers, which means different electron density, different peripheral sub substituents can make affect the stability by about as much as density affects the stability. So the linker is not just an inert spacer, it really affects the structure, it really affects the bonding in the materials. And again, working, Thomas Love Frischich, working with some of his uh, theoretical colleagues and ex-students who now have independent faculty positions have obtained some insight into why this is the case. And we've used even some of the concepts from essentially from organic chemistry to look at the electron density in the materials and to say, well, the linker still behaves sort of well, maybe like an organic mole, like an ordinary organic molecule. And we can get some insight from theoretical organic chemistry. But that is a little bit beyond what I want to talk about today because what I really wanted to talk about, and I have talked about, and that is that mechanochemistry effectively uh, lifts barriers toward forming more stable structures and therefore is a very useful synthetic tool. And I might say that, you know, little tricks of how long you grind, how intensely you grind, do you put in small amounts of organics? Do you breathe on the sample? Do you do it in high humidity, low humidity? The synthesis 
you know, is quite sensitive to external conditions, and it really takes experts in the synthesis to make the best materials. So here, for example, are some thermodynamic stabilities, some enthalpies of formation from dense phases of a few selected MOFs. And then we look at the temperature at which they decompose on heating, and there really isn't a strong correlation. So what this says is that the decomposition of a material on heating is controlled by the kinetics. It's not a thermodynamic decomposition temperature. In fact, most of these materials are metastable, and they're certainly metastable with respect to oxidation. And the temperature at which they decompose is a function of the structure of the material, the thermodynamics of the material, but more importantly, the actual mechanisms and kinetics of the decomposition process, whether the decomposition occurs in an inert atmosphere or as we mostly see it in an oxidizing atmosphere. So the lesson to be learned here is that often what thermodynamics will tell you is no, the process is not simply thermodynamically controlled, it is kinetically controlled. But if you don't understand what the thermodynamics is, you cannot understand whether a process is thermodynamically controlled, whether one reaches some sort of equilibrium state, or whether the final state will constantly depend on time because it is kinetically controlled. So the conclusion then is that the stability decreases as the volume increases in both zeolites, uh, zeolitic uh, imidazole framework, ZIFs, and other MOFs. The synthesis typically goes downhill through a complex energy landscape of polymorphs, and the, inner, the organic linker plays an active role in the structure bonding and thermodynamics and the electron density. So these are essentially my major conclusions. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have a few questions from the audience. First of all, you mentioned uh, previous simulations that had done have been done. But if you could choose any simulations that might be done in the future, irregardless of simulation constraints, what would you like to see modeled that would complement your experiments? Yeah. So. I think the most important thing to model is the role of the linker and the competition between the linker bonding to the metal node versus the electron density in the linkers, because what one does is one affects the structure and the stability by having linkers that, you know, are simply straight chain or have pendant groups on them or tend to curl up some more. And there are certainly a whole bunch of flexibility transitions like one sees in zeolites in these MOFs where by varying conditions, one can vary the exact conformation of the linker and then the details of the structure. And that's important as well in the function of the structure. So I think focusing on the organic linker and on the competition between bonding within the linker and bonding to the metal node is where we need as much help from theory as possible. And, you know, those are state of the art calculations that, you know, hopefully will continue improving with time. All right, thank you. So another question is we saw that you the experiments were performed at relatively high temperatures. Are different temperatures optimal for synthesizing different types of different zeotypes or MOFs? Okay, the calorimetric experiments are done where the final dissolved product is at 700 or 800 degrees C. But if you have a reaction which says the reactants at room temperature are dropped into the calorimeter and go to a set of products at 700 or 800 degrees C. And the products of the same composition do the same thing. The difference then, which is the enthalpy of formation that we measure, actually refers to room temperature. So the high temperature that we do calorimetry at is really not relevant to the thermodynamic data we get. 
If we look at the decomposition reactions, where I showed you a slide with decomposition reactions, uh, we can calculate the energetics of the decomposition reaction at any temperature. If the decomposition reaction produces gaseous phases, the gaseous phases have higher entropy, so temperature favors that decomposition reaction. But what we realize is that the temperature at which the reaction begins to happen is higher than the temperature at which it thermodynamically could happen. Got it. Thank you. Let's do just one more question from the audience. You mentioned the effect of humidity. How does humidity affect the process? So we don't know exactly. What we do know is that a number of these MOFs, not all of them, and and the ZIFs are better behaved than some of the MOFs. Uh, for example, the MOF 74 case is very uh, humidity sensitive. If you think of a reaction of a MOF plus water goes to some decomposition products, that really is a hydrolysis reaction. In a way, it is the reverse of the formation reaction of the MOF, because the formation reaction of the MOF says the metal oxide plus the linker forms the MOF and releases and releases water. So basically, the effect of water thermodynamically is going to be greatest if, in fact, the MOF is the least stable. The effect of water kinetically, again, becomes a matter of the mechanism of the reaction. And that's, you know, the reaction probably starts at the surface or it may start at internal pores, et cetera. All right, excellent. Well, thank you again for that presentation and thank you for being part of the mechanochemistry discussions. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Professor Nabrotsky, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you've missed any of the previous speakers as part of the mechanochemistry discussions, I encourage you to check them out, all available on YouTube. We also have some great speakers in the upcoming months, and we hope that you will join them, join us for all of them. Thank you again.